Human beings are nasty, messy creatures. And understand, I include myself in that. I, it's a point of shame for me. But human beings just leave shit around. And when talking about astronauts, I mean that literally. Like when they went to the moon, right, for the Apollo missions, they actually left behind 96 bags of human poop, pee, vomit, and other waste. And they're still up there possibly teeming with microbial ecosystems, right? Because the men who led humanity into the space age also had plastic bags wrapped around their butts with adhesive tape. And they just dumped that shit on the ground before they left. And now well, there's a high likelihood that any life in those bags are dead from 50 years of exposure to the moon's harsh conditions. Many scientists actually want to bring that shit back from our next lunar landing and study them to see if anything survived. But also very notably, poop aside, there is far more trash with zero scientific value littering the lunar surface. We're talking rocket boosters, orbiters, rovers, modules, golf balls, boots, cameras, backpacks, blankets, towels, hammers, tongs, rakes, shovels, wet wipes, food packaging, and much more. And that list, while it sounds long, is also expected to grow as up to 100 lunar missions are planned in the next decade by governments and private companies. And while, yeah, the, the pollution on the moon's surface could become a nuisance in the future, the more immediate problem is all the garbage that we're leaving between the moon and the Earth. Because that space junk includes everything from entire rocket stages and dead satellites to stray nuts and bolts and flecks of paint. The European Space Agency estimating that near-Earth space is cluttered with some 36,000 pieces of debris larger than 10 centimeters. And that's in addition to a million pieces between one and 10 centimeters and 130 million bits smaller than one centimeter. And I know it's easy to think like, okay, a few centimeters, who cares? That's nothing. Well, one, don't size shame. It's 2023, y'all. And two, the, the size matters less than the speed here, right? Because you have to consider how fast orbital velocity is. Right? Think of it like a gun and a bullet. Bullets in general are pretty small. And when we're talking about space and space junk, even the tiniest piece of debris traveling at over 17,000 miles per hour, 10 times faster than a bullet, it can puncture a spacesuit or damage a sensitive piece of equipment. And very unfortunately with that, we cannot track any of the smallest fragments which make up most of the debris. So there's actually no way to avoid getting hit by them without warning. And so then the more debris there is, the more likely some pieces are to crash into other pieces, breaking them into clouds of even smaller pieces that in turn crash into others, right? And all of that creating a chain reaction experts call the Kessler syndrome. And while it's a general concern, also more specifically that endangers astronauts on the ISS, who notably with this problem had to take cover in a spacecraft dock with a station while debris flew by in 2021. And all of that also posing a threat to all the functioning satellites that make GPS possible, provide internet access, and monitor the climate and agriculture. But also as the space economy expands and low Earth orbit gets crowded, those satellites themselves may become an issue. Right? Because there are nearly 8,000 satellites, both dead and alive, within several hundred miles of the Earth right now. And according to one estimate, that number could actually grow to as much as several hundred thousand by 2027. And a chunk of those coming from mega constellations or vast networks of satellites meant to provide continuous coverage of the Earth like a web. You know, the big ones right now are SpaceX's Starlink, Amazon's Kuiper OneWeb, and China's envisioned Guo Wang system. And there, Starlink and particular getting a lot of complaints from astronomers who say that its satellites are leaving bright streaks across their telescopes images of space. But the problem that most experts are worrying about with this is the congestion and risk of collision that these things cause. Or I mean, just talking about Starlink, Starlink satellites reportedly performed more than 25,000 maneuvers to avoid potential collisions with other spacecraft and debris during just the six months ending back in May. Which to give you some context and a comparison, that is double the number of avoidance maneuvers during the previous six months period. And keep in mind, SpaceX has only put up a little over 10% of the more than 40,000 satellites it plans to deploy. And the key thing here is the increase in maneuvers is exponential, not linear. Meaning that as we put up more and more stuff up there, the likelihood of a collision doesn't just increase, it increases faster and faster. So according to astronautics expert Hugh Lewis, by 2028, Starlink will have to maneuver about a million times every half year, which among other things could end up depleting the satellite's fuel supply before their five-year lifetimes are up. Now with this, thankfully at their altitude, Starlink satellites should naturally fall back to Earth pretty soon after they die because atmospheric drag pulls them down. But then that could just pump a steady stream of vaporized metals into the stratospheres as they burn up in re-entry, which notably as a recent study showed could potentially affect the Earth's climate, similar to how sulfuric particles do, with about 10% of sulfuric acid particles right now containing trace amounts of metals from spacecraft, but that could also rise to as much as 50%. And one day, the authors here warned that aerosols linked to space debris could actually outnumber particles produced by meteors naturally burning up. And in addition to that, the higher that you go in altitude, the longer it takes for things to naturally fall back down, and anything above 600 miles just sits there. And so in an attempt to fix that, you have satellite operators like OneWeb pledging to leave enough fuel in each craft for it to push itself up or down out of popular orbits. But with that, there's always the possibility of technical malfunctions, which we've actually seen before. Right? In 2012, for example, the European Space Agency failed to remove its 8.8-ton Earth observation satellite from orbit, and so now it's just one of the most dangerous pieces of space debris out there, and it'll be flying around up there for centuries. And so that's something to consider as you have many different countries that are geopolitical rivals, not to mention a whole economy of private actors with their own profit motives just throwing tons of shit into orbit. And with that, it's easy to see why experts are ringing the alarm about the sustainability of space, with, for example, Harvard astronomer Jonathan McDowell putting it in simpler terms, saying it's going to be like an interstate highway at rush hour in a snowstorm 
uniform with everyone driving much too fast. Except there are multiple interstate highways crossing each other with no stoplights. But there's also a question of can that change, right? Getting some kind of space traffic management system into place will require international cooperation and relations between the US, Russia, and China have only grown colder. Plus, you have many critics arguing here that the current legal frameworks governing space are just out of date. Right? I mean, you have the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, but that just says no one country can own any part of the moon and that celestial bodies should only be used for peaceful purposes. But you know, that says nothing about companies or private individuals. And either way, if no one owns the moon, no one is responsible for cleaning it up either. Then, I mean, you also have the 1979 Moon Agreement declaring that the moon and its natural resources are the common heritage of humanity. But you know, uh, a key thing there, the United States, China, and Russia never actually signed it. Nor have Russia and China signed the US-led Artemis Accords, which seek to establish similar norms. But all that said, we have at least seen some progress within what we can control. Right last year, the FCC proposed a rule requiring satellite operators to dispose of their assets within five years of completing their mission. And last month, we actually saw the agency fine a company for violating its anti-debris rules for the first time ever. With that happening after Dish Network failed to properly deorbit one of its satellites, though the fine was only $150,000. Right, so with that, if you're going to try and force these companies to actually do the right thing, the penalties, they just have to be massive. Some would say maybe almost even ridiculous. Because I mean, $150,000 for some of these companies, it's probably negligible. But with this concerning and fascinating situation, uh, in the meantime, as we wait to see how everything develops, I'd love to know your thoughts here. Let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below.